Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, I would like to do a product review. So this is a fully analog two-way crossover board by X-Kits. And so just a little bit of discussion about the market segment that this covers. This is touted by the brand X-Kits as an audiophile type solution. So in the past, I've looked at different fully analog active crossovers and they either are meant for pro sound or they're meant for car audio. And in each case, I did not find that the sound quality was there for audio file applications. So this piqued my interest. So I bought two of them. So it's a mono board. It requires two for your two boards if you want to do a left and right stereo pair. And so how it works is it has a RCA input and then two RCA outputs. The two RCA outputs is one's for your low frequency and one's for your high frequency. Um, this is high, this is low. Um, so it doesn't have a power supply. You need to provide 10 to 24 volt DC into this these uh, terminal pins here. And so what I wanna do in this video is talk about some of the features that are on this board, do some measurements, try to integrate into a two-way speaker to see how well it does and then provide you with what my listening impressions are for this product. All right, let's talk details on this. So, like I mentioned before, you have the RCA coming in for your, this would come from your preamp and then this would go, these would go to your individual amps. So you would have an amplifier for the bass and then you'd have an amplifier for the treble. So this creates what would be a bi-amped, fully active configuration. So some other really interesting features on this is that you have your treble adjustment and your bass adjustment. And these little brass adjustment pots are what you turn with a micro screwdriver. So 20 revolutions uh, will bring it either fully off or fully on. So these aren't like tone controls, these are actual level adjustments for the actual outputs of these RCAs. So this would be the bass, this would be the treble. And so the other interesting feature is that it has uh, BSC, baffle step correction. So if you know speaker design, you know that a woofer will have a rising response due to the width of the baffle. And so this allows you to actually adjust the contour, so it basically is an EQ that allows you to flatten the frequency response of the woofer. And then you also see here, there's some jumpers. These jumpers, you can pull them out and put them in either A, B, or C slot. And so in the documentation, you can pick this based on the actual physical width of your baffle. So very, very useful features here. This blue adjustment knob here is actually to adjust for hum and noise coming in from the power supply. And so what I did is I, I did get some buzzing noise. And, and so you turn it counterclockwise until the buzzing noise goes away. This is a removable, uh, oh, sorry for the focus there. That's a removable unit that is actually the crossover point. So this is, specified when you order you, and I selected a 1200 Hertz crossover point. So this, this is uh, replaceable if you want to actually change the crossover point. So it just, it just pops out uh, off the circuit board there. All right. So for the measured response, I used the autumn series base cabinet, which is a small 50 liter Onken style enclosure has an eight inch Fostex FW208HS woofer. And for the horn, I used the TAD TD2001 on the, uh, I'll just bring it around here. Oh, this thing's heavy. Okay, so this is another prototype horn, original prototype for the ES800. Okay, and so it's a 800 Hertz cutoff. So 1200 Hertz uh, crossover point there is no problem for that. And so first step uh, is I measured the frequency response of the woofer and you can see it there. So I used the baffle step uh, adjustment pot to bring the woofer to a flat 
response and I found that uh, you really had to have measurement equipment to acoustically measure where things were going because it took a lot of turns of that pot to get it um, to actually move and you know four or two revolutions is like maybe one db of, of the baffle step correction so now moving on I decided or I, I measured um, I actually I'm going to show you two measurements here for the base so the first measurement is simply the uh, measurement at one meter ungated and then I decided that it looked a little rough uh, for this presentation and so I did a near field measurement which you can see there okay so the next is I measured just the high frequency and so you can see there there's the frequency response very nice steep 24 dB LR uh, slope and so these are um, quite difficult to achieve with a passive crossover so we're getting um, the advantage there of steep crossover slopes especially for the woofer you know it's it's often detrimental to the overall sound quality of the woofer when you start introducing a lot of components to get a steep crossover slope so this is uh, bypassing all of the all of that additional components between the amplifier and the driver and with this active crossover there's there's that direct connection between the amplifier and the woofer which often results in a very much more very uh, improved bass control a lot better bass definition so next you can see here I've done the combined between the high frequency and the low frequency and you can see how it sums together for a flat frequency response so um, I only show you this simply that you know I was able to get relatively good results uh, with using uh, good drivers so and then here this is just showing you the frequency response uh, the summed frequency response so this was taken at one meter in my listening space the, there is some frequency response irregularities below one kilohertz, which is, is from uh, room reflections. So now I thought I would show you the burst decay, not really related to the product, but it's an interesting side note. Um, you can see there where the horn takes over, the burst decay is, is very clean. And so you, and you see with the woofer, this is an ungated burst decay. You can see with the woofer that it's it's you know not nearly as clean as the compression driver which seems obvious but this does explain the design rationale for people that are trying to get the horn to cross as low as possible because of the superior sound quality of the horn and also for interest sake I've done the uh, distortion sweep there's nothing really revealing here other than it is nice and low uh, through from 100 hertz up to 1k and th actually through the crossover point in particular uh, that distortion is nice and low so my listening impressions so how I did my my uh, listening test is I set up my turntable and the reason I did my turntable is because the fully analog solution having everything analog through the signal chain is very appealing to vinyl lovers so often it's the case when you introduce an additional uh, analog to digital to digital analog conversion that there's uh, there's a an impact on sound quality to um, you know the detriment to sound so I didn't have any other uh, DSP units on hand to compare directly against except for the mini DSP 2x4 which is in the same price category as the X kits, which you know makes it for a relatively good comparison. And I know the Mini DSP 2x4 is quite popular. So what I found when I listened to the Mini DSP, um, there was a very two-dimensional sound stage. The low-level detail retrieval was not there, and um, actually the noise floor was quite high. So with horn drivers, there was a lot of hiss coming through the horns when nothing was playing and that was something that I could measure and I actually measured the distortion sweep on on the mini DSP and distortion was quite a bit higher than on the X kits product so 
So when I switched to the X kits, I found that immediately you had that detail back. And so, especially with vinyl, you know, well-recorded vinyl, there's incredible detail in the upper treble and there's also really good transient detail, you know, with stringed instruments and, and uh, you know, the trumpet has a very, very high level of dynamic range. I found that the Mini DSP definitely softened those leading edge of transients and the X kits fully retained the, uh, the sound quality. So basically this, the X kits sounded excellent. It had no kind of sonic signature of its own. It simply passed the music through. And a few caveats with this. So you don't have parametric EQ, you don't have delay with the X kits. So it puts more of a burden on making sure that your speakers are designed properly. You can't make those corrections. So you need to make sure that the drivers are physically time aligned, which for horn speakers isn't necessarily a challenge. And so you also need to make sure that the raw frequency response of each driver in, in the enclosures or in the horn are relatively flat. So the reason being obviously is that you don't have any kind of an EQ adjustment other than the baffle step adjustment that's included on the circuit board. So I think that if you're up for the task and you are comfortable with designing speakers that meet those criteria, then I think the X kits is a really good option that allows you to um, have that direct connection, particularly for the woofer, to have a direct connection with the amplifier. Conclusion, um, it's a very good product sonically. It's excellent. I was very happy with it. There was no, no uh, hissing noise coming from the compression driver with, without music playing. I put my ear right up to the, to the mouth of the horn. I could barely hear any uh, kind of a hiss. So noise floor is very low on this. So yeah, great product.